start. Okay. Uh, hello, friends. This is Tim Kirby. Hardcore. Tim Kirby, Russia. Hardcore. Hello, friends. From beautiful Chekhov County, Russia, where the way in wheat can still smell sweet while the wind goes ripping down the plain. If that's how that song went, I don't remember. But in Chekhov, things are awesome. It's a little bit rainy outside. That's okay. Oop, table's shaking. Hold on. Table's a little bit shaking here. But anyways, guys, welcome to Tim Kirby, Russia. Greetings from Chekhov, and today we have quite the show for you indeed. We have some big topics today. We're going to talk finally about the Wagner Group. We are going to talk a little bit about Russia in the World Health Organization. Not a whole lot, but a little bit. We're going to talk about Igor Dadon, the former president or true president of Moldova, getting arrested. Uh, we're going to talk about interest rates in Russia dropping and if Belarus is going to join the war in Ukraine based on news that I got today. So those are our five topics. And uh, yeah, guys, so I think uh, here we go. And if you're wondering, doing good, exercising, got a match on uh, Sunday against the section of Phoenixes. So we've uh, uh, got to defeat those uh, darn birds on Sunday. So we're uh, exercising today, hardcore practice tomorrow. Uh, and then on Sunday, you got the game, so feeling good about that. Anyways, uh, some of you were wondering a lot about the Wagner Group. That was a big uh, uh, question that kept coming up in all these live streams. Uh, and remember, guys, if you want to chime in, uh, there's an option where you can sort of click on your name, which is over... It's weird. The, <laughs> the camera actually reverses things. You're over here, but I need to point over there. So if you're over here and you see your little name there, you can count it and raise your hand to participate in the conversation if you want. Uh, you can also send messages to basically anywhere in the chat. Like, uh, you know, you look in Tim Kirby Hardcore, you see the post where it said, it says Telegram live stream starts in 15 minutes. If you comment under that, I will see it. And you better believe it. And we already have 120 some messages in the chat from earlier today. Uh, guys, things are going good. Thank you very much for being a part of the Tim Kirby Russia universe here. Much appreciated. Uh, in fact, how many people do we have now? 2,349. That's pretty good for a pretty niche, <laughs> a pretty niche uh, universe here. Uh, so thank you very much for being with me. Anyways, the Wagner Group. Okay, guys. So I read a bunch of articles about the Wagner Group. This is a sort of a mercenary group that, or accused of being a mercenary group. This is the problem. Uh, this group of men who seems to engage in military actions, uh, who are called the Wagner Group by outsiders, uh, are pretty famous in Russia within dealing with problems in Mali. Uh, something went wrong in Mali, and Russia has sort of been in there, but really using the sort of Wagner Group, not so much using the uh, main Russian armed forces. This whole uh, thing in Mali, maybe there's some uh, more wise political analysts who know a bit more about what the real objective th is, is down there, besides just um, teaching France a lesson. Uh, besides that, uh, I think there's a lot more going on at play, but I'll, I'll research that another day. Um, uh, to be honest, this is one of those topics where I'm a little bit scared of finding out because I like when Russia does things closer to Russia. Then again, supposedly, just like in Syria, they were invited in, so uh, who knows? But this uh, group of guys, first off, one problem when looking it up, in Russian, from Russian mainstream sources, there's really not a ton about them that you can find with a casual search. Perhaps I was doing the wrong search terms. Perhaps, I don't know, uh, perhaps this uh, title of the Wagner Group isn't really their official title, or perhaps that's something the Russian media doesn't like to talk about. Because everything about them in Russian, okay, is cited mostly from Western sources. Now, I'm not saying this is a conspiracy theory from the West, like the West just, you know, made this up, but it seems like it's something that the West wants to put light on but that the Russian side seems to not want to put light on, uh, to, to shed light on, I guess is the proper expression. But let me explain why. Because generally Russia is very good at reacting to the BS of the West. People may not understand that from the English-speaking world, but everyone here knows everything that's written anywhere. There's especially thanks to this thing called Inasmi. It's a site. It means like uh, foreign mainstream media. Uh, and they seem to translate like everything from Every major news source across the world is pretty crazy. That would be inosmi.ru or su. Mm, yeah, we'll try that one later. Uh, but anyways, it's kind of a neat uh, website. And uh, they do a lot of translating. And so Russians are very, very aware of what's being said about them uh, by the rest of the world, which is something Russians are really obsessed with. That's probably why they have that site and probably why it's so, so popular. But uh, so 
even still, like, I think that a lot of the Russian stuff I was reading about it seemed to be using something like an Inesmi site to gather stuff from the West. Because all the sources about them are all from, like, the, you know, uh, BBC, Daily Mail, uh, you know, like, the government-funded stuff, like Voice of America and all that. So, anyways, unfortunately, uh, the history of them seems to really be related to, um, seems to be told by the West. And the West basically says that there was this sort of group of uh, fighters that kind of formed up around 2014-ish with the the Maidan uh, to sort of go into the Donbass and try to do something. And they were called the Slavic Corps. Uh, And, of course, ironically, or maybe truthfully, who knows, because it's kind of hard to say. Uh, they accuse uh, that group of being some sort of, again, like basically the, they're the Azov. They're Russians, Azov, with the same sort of uh, the, the, the Nazi satanic mentality and so on and so forth. That's how the Western uh, press sort of described them. But again, guys, how often is the Western press concerned about telling the truth about Russia? I don't know. Uh, there's also a lot of people with fun names, like the guy who's in charge of it. Uh, his last name was Utkin, which is like Ducky, which is very cute. Uh, and so he uh, uh, was like a you know Russian army guy who left, and he's in control of it. But the main thing is that the Russian press sort of pr- portrays this organization as something semi-secret, somewhat amorphous, kind of financed by this this rich guy and that rich guy, but also by the government, but not really being on the government payrolls. And uh, all the Russian sources said that they're not registered anywhere. Like, there is no... Wagner Group uh, Incorporated, like on the Russian tax sheets. Why? Because mercenary groups in Russia are forbidden. Uh, if I remember what they wrote in the article correctly, uh, the Russian uh, like uh, civil law book point three hundred fifty nine. Uh, no mercenaries. Uh, remember, that's what I told you guys uh, when we first discussed the Wagner Group just a little bit. Was I was pretty sure that during Medvedev they banned all mercenary activity in Russia because of stuff like the private Nazi battalions in the Ukraine. Of course, those, those didn't quite exist. They, they were in their proto form. But, you know, because uh, the Russian government sort of understands the um, problematic nature of mercenary groups uh, and their attitudes. So technically within Russia, all mercenary activity is banned. Yet there is this weird group of guys who seem to be part of it, but no one really knows who they are and none of their funding can be tracked. And the only people who are interested in linking this to anyone are the are in the West. So this is kind of a big mystery. Uh, well, let me say, what does it smell like? Let's just smell it. Oh yeah. Okay. It smells like a little bit of something like a lighter black water or something. And remember, uh, black water also likes to change names. Aren't they like the Academy now? Or they think they've changed names five times. But when when I was a kid, they were called black water. Uh, these sort of uh, mercenary groups that like to change names, change leaderships, and make it very vague as to who's financing them. So um, there's sort of also this, this weird exception to the rule. Uh, I think this may be something that Russia might be doing as sort of a uh, means to get certain jobs done without it really being clear. So unfortunately, guys, uh, I cannot say that I really support this kind of behavior because it seems outside the brilliant concept of Basically, Russia made a good move by banning mercenaries. Now it's like, well, maybe we kind of need one mercenary group, which begs the question, why do you need a mercenary group when you have such a wonderful standing army? I don't know. I think the answer to that question might be very negative. But unfortunately, guys, uh, essentially, the Western media says they're Azov for Russia. The Russian media doesn't talk about them at all. The Russian, like, alternative media and just, like, people on the Internet just quote Western stuff about them. And technically, any organization of that type would be illegal. So, yeah, it remains kind of a mystery. Uh, The question is, why are they called the Wagner Group? Uh, Because apparently, according to Western media sources, I believe this was the Daily. What a wonderful source of uh, information that is. Uh, It's because the leader seemed to be obsessed with the Third Reich as in Wagner or something, you know, like Wagner, I believe. the, But they didn't say the composer. They didn't say specifically the composer, just that there, he was obsessed with things that I guess are related to the Third Reich. Again, uh, this is the brilliance of the Western media. Uh, <laughs> they just say stuff, so who knows? But uh, no one in the uh, supposed leadership or the supposed financiers of these organizations has a name that's Germanic, none of them. So... Who knows? That's what it is. They used to be the Slavic Corps, which is a much better name. But uh, anyways, 
there you go. That's our little uh, rough research into the Wagner Group. Uh, let's move on to our next topic, if there are no questions. We have a few people listening. Very, very good. Uh, if you guys have no questions, maybe you do, maybe you don't. Someone just wrote okay. All right. <laughs> That's uh, the easiest question to answer. So anyways, uh, moving on was with a conversation I was having with someone who might not want to be mentioned, so I won't. And she was kind of talking about there's uh, some conflicting articles. So we have from Politico that says that Russia takes the first steps to withdraw from uh, the D World Trade Organization and the World Health Organization, which are things that I've heard also from within Russia. This is from May 26th, 2022. That's a fresh article. Uh, so anyways, it says, real quick, the Russian government is starting to process Let's start with the process of unilaterally withdrawing from a series of international bodies, including the World Trade Organization, the World Health Organization. The Russian Duma's deputy speaker, Pyotr Talstoy, who I've met in person, nice guy, good TV show host as well, said on Tuesday, we have to uh, we have worked to revise our international obligations treaties that, that today bring no benefit, but instead directly harm our country. The foreign ministry sent a list of such agreements to the state Duma, Talstoy said. Uh, together with the Federation Council, we plan to analyze them and propose to withdraw, he added. Uh, and yes, if you're wondering, Tolstoy is, I believe, a very distant, or I should say now fifth generation or fourth generation uh, relative of the famous Tolstoy. So uh, there you go. But uh, this is the interesting thing about this is, is we'll get back to that. Because she put it in contrast to a certain black-pilled author that will go unnamed here who posted something uh, that said uh, – he basically posted uh, a message over Twitter from the Russian mi mission in Geneva that said that Russia will actively participate in the upcoming 75th World Health Assembly, which begins on May 22nd. Uh, so before this Tolstoy – you know, even before this event that would have for them happened in the future is even before the big declaration by Tolstoy. Uh, it says May 22nd, aiming for productive work and international colleagues and, health, and uh, address global health care issues. As for rumors that Russia will withdraw from the World Health Organization, they are simply not true. And that was published apparently on Twitter on May 20th. So uh, we're seeing sort of a conflicting report here. And uh, this uh, woman was sort of asking me, why is that? What's this? What, what is this all about? Is the person uh, who is sharing the screenshot from Twitter, uh, is he lying? Uh, one of the black pill boys, uh, is he not? Well, first off, guys, again, this is going back to this, the concept that everyone who keeps writing me forgets. Governments are not monolithic. Uh, should we actually start a chant like that? Governments are not monolithic. Well, that doesn't, that doesn't chant well. No monolith. No monolith. Uh, like... Uh, you know, uh, for example, I was even uh, uh, invited to this year write my thoughts about uh, immigration policy that were given uh, to people uh, in the state Duma, which I consider a very high honor. Now, within the state Duma, there's sort of a fraction that wants to close off Russia forever, and there's a fraction that wants to brain drain the West. I'm on the brain drain fraction, a faction, although I'm not in the state Duma, but as you see, I, I uh, seem to be on that side of the issue, right? So it's a good good, good indicator that the government is in an argument with itself that we need to get more talented people from the West. All sorts of people in the West are now becoming dissatisfied. Bring them here. That's the side I'm on. And the other side is like, no, the West hates us. They're awful. They should have, if their government, well, it's this stupid, stupid reasoning that people, people get the government they deserve. We could we could, we could break down that statement a whole lot, but it is uh, one of my least favorite things to ever read online because it always comes to the dumbest of the dumb. But there are the people who believe that yes, and if the West is falling apart, then they deserve to suffer because they should have been our friend when they had the chance. My dick is two inches long, unbelievable. So, anyways, that's the the the, the other side of the issue. It's an example of where governments are not monolithic. And guess what? When it comes to everything, that's the same thing. So when we are looking this uh, message here uh, that was from the Twitter supporting Russia's uh, eternal vigilance of the World Health Organization, well, that came from the Russian uh, diplomatic mission in Geneva, supposedly. Okay, so uh, if that is true, if this tweet, if this tweet is real, uh, then guess what? It was written by some PR, SMM, 70,000 ruble a month, schmuck 
who just sits there and writes what they think they need to write, which is just write something positive. Uh, how many times have you heard an American or British or English speaking politician just be like, Oh my gosh, we reaffirm our commitment to ABCD. What are we referring our commitment to? Re reaffirming our commitment to? Uh, today it's H. Reaffirming our commitment to point H. Uh, yeah, sure. Whatever. And then they just go on. And remember, that happens everywhere in the world, too. So that's why, I mean, maybe it might be surprising to someone, but if you really study, especially the Russian government, uh, over all these years, you'll see that, like, uh, it's not that crazy for one day some uh, office lackey to just write generic positive things on, like, some sort of timetable because he has to, uh, and then have, like, a major Duma member come out and say, no, we're not going to do this anymore. That's totally within like the norms of the way Russia works, and especially the new Russia, the post-special operation Russia, where guys like everything here is changing. Everything is here is changing. Like the Overton window, it's gotten big and fat. It's jumped. Uh, it's taken a huge jump. We don't even know where it's landing. It's it's gotten fat. It's jumped. It's in the air. Who knows where it's going to come down? Uh, and so, like the alter the options of uh, leaving a lot of these organizations are now on the table. And we also can't forget that governments do not have infinite energy so it's not like the day that the special operation started and apparently the multipolar world was born it wasn't like on february 24th they could launch a special operation and end every commitment or participation in some international whatever within a 24-hour period that also wasn't an option another thing guys is uh you know an organization that you're probably mostly skeptical of the un right probably all of you listening have seen the un serve a certain superpower's interests more so than uh, the world's interests. Uh, you know, well, where's the headquarters located? Uh, but, but I'll tell you one thing. Would it be wise for Russia to leave the UN, giving up its Security Council vote and leave because the UN is kind of a bad organization? Or would it be better to stay in the UN and keep that Security Council vote to keep it ground down and make sure that any anti-Russian policies there don't go through. Ah, that's one of the potential uh, reasons why Russia, well, Russia was completely colonized in the 90s. That's reason number one why Russia might be doing something that seems it's contradictory to its uh, stated objectives, its spiritual objectives, and where it seems to be going. So you have the colonization factor of the 90s. Uh, number two is sometimes you got to be in an organization to make change, observe it, sabotage it. Although this is definitely not a historical movie. It's a movie that I think everyone's at least familiar with, uh, Schindler's, Schindler's List, right? Where Oscar Schindler has to run this uh, concentration camp. Now, of course, again, don't, don't, let's not get to an argument about the historicity of it. Who cares? It's Hollywood. Hollywood ruins everything. But it provides the situation where you have this guy, Schindler, where He's in charge of doing something that's inherently wrong. So what would a good person do? A good person would do something stupid like Jesse Ventura did when he was like, well, wait, let's see Jesse Ventura accent. Uh, okay, oh, I'm losing my Minnesota. Oh, so he's like, well, I, I can't uh, do this anymore. Gotta go down to Mexico and I'm gonna do some surfing there. And uh, it's too corrupt. I gotta, gotta give up which was in a, a, a horribly, horribly short-sighted decision because if he really cares about America and he was, you know, in the, the Navy SEALs and all that, you've got to hold the line. If you're in an evil system and you give up your spot, guess who's going to replace you? Someone who's very effective, very evil. So if Oscar Schindler were to have just said, no, I don't want to hurt people, first off, that could have been a quick end to his life. Uh, secondly, what if then he was replaced by someone who really wanted to hurt people? It's better for him to stay at that death camp and make sure it's the least effective death camp that's ever been. I know that sounds insane, but that's the way that politics and government actually work. And uh, my friends, that's another reason why Russia may remain involved in certain organizations in order to kind of sit there and make sure things grind down. But uh, organizations more so like the uh, World uh, Trade Organization, World Health Organization, uh, I don't really know if Russia benefits uh, or is able to do the Oscar Schindler effect. Uh, within those organizations, and that's a little bit beyond my competency, 
but it looks like maybe they don't care anymore and it, it doesn't matter because uh, there's not much they can do to Russia now that they haven't done. I mean, you can't even really trap Russia anymore. Uh, what more can they do? They've got played all their cards, so maybe it's now time to leave. But that's just something I want to talk about. It's, again, getting into these nuances and how uh, gamesmanship works uh, within politics, maybe a little bit of Machiavellianism, uh, because I'll tell you one thing. Uh, I read a lot of, not in our group, I love you guys, but when I go through comments on the internet, everyone expects politicians to be so blunt and so honest with their intentions. And guys, that's not the way it works. That's not the way you win. If any of you are excited about Russia right now, the Russia that's uh, uh, in 2022, able to economically and militarily <laughs> roll the West, uh, and create this this incredible achievement that, that that they have in Ukraine and especially economically and how things are changing. We had the choice of waiting eight years and a lot of people dying along the way, or going in morally in 2014 and being crushed and destroyed forever. There you go, because Russia in 2014 was not ready by Russia's own admission. Let's see. Are there any questions here, guys? Sorry. Depressing topic. Extremely depressing topic so far. Okay. Oh, boy. I'm not dumb. And in democracies, people do get the government they deserve. Why? So what you're saying is, okay, so let's talk about this. People get the governments they deserve. Okay. So... The person, the people who are then born in, let's just say, North Korea, they get the government they deserve. How are they supposed to change it? How are you supposed to change your government in democracy? What are you going to do about it? What would it look like? What would you have to do? Oh, you said only in democracy, so other systems don't count. Okay, so you only get the government you deserve. Again, how are you expected to change it you today okay you will grow up you're 18 you can go out and vote you can go let's just go again back to america because i'm american democrat or republican what are you going to do oh they um possibly uh manipulated uh, a certain electoral process uh back then in 20 2020 what are you going to do about it nope sorry my friend uh i don't know approve to me show me an example in history where people got the government that they deserved or, or did get the government that they deserved, how that really depended on the masses, just the, the guys sitting at home, the grunts out there, the masses, that everything really depends on the masses rather than history being more of a battle of elites. Uh, because guess what? It is more a battle of elites. Uh, that's that's the way history works. Uh, let's, uh, let's fight about that. So Temi Tayo, uh, please show me some examples where people just on their own, rose up and took control of their democracy without any sort of influence from like the elites or being organized to do so or funded to do so. Show me an example of, uh, from history of that. Okay. And we'll, we'll talk. Ray, I'm not sure if it's just me, but now I can't hear No, 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 no. I can see the little thing, Ray, the above where my name is. It's uh, it jiggles and vibrates when my voice is going. So no, you should be able to hear me. Uh, perhaps I'm a little far from the mic. Uh, Dustin says, I can hear just a slight lag. Please forgive me, guys. The internet in this room is, is fantastic. 300 megabits a second. Geez, just look at us in a dumb fuck UK. We could have voted for the reform party, but no. Back to these inept buffoons in the conservative party. Okay. Uh, people have done a lot of experimenting over voting and the way human beings make decisions. Human beings almost always Pick what's familiar and understood. Large electoral sways don't happen. Like in elections, if there's, say, um, the Republicans, for, let's just say for president, uh, one time get, uh, yeah, let's just say, because it's I know it's an electoral college, but let's just say they get 40% of the vote. And then the next time they get 45. That's actually a massive shift in terms of electoral politics. Electoral politics are very... Uh, Let's just say slow to change, okay? You're not going to really see like a massive shift where something comes out of the blue and then all of a sudden it gets like 30% of the overall vote. That doesn't happen. It's a real evolutionary process, and that's something to do the way to, to work to do with the way that human beings think. 
Uh, again, you could vote vote for a reform party, but no. Okay. Well, here's something. Um, we make decisions based on the opportunities presented to us. And the opportunities to present it to us are often presented to us by those who have money, right? Uh, you know, you can go to the movie theater and theoretically pick any movie, but the ones that get advertised get watched. That's a huge thing that I have a lot of trouble convincing people in Russia of is that uh, the marketing is really what matters. And there's no way to defeat the marketing. I mean, look at in America. The only people who sort of were able to buck the system of the two-party system who didn't have this, like, media machine behind them well, it was Donald Trump via the Republican Party, but he was already famous before then. And then billionaire, Texas billionaire Ross Perot, who was able to just finance his own campaign. Uh, what was that in the 90s, I guess, against Clinton, I believe. Uh, but otherwise, you just can't because there's no other option. It's not seen. And that's really not people's fault. You're also expecting that the average person, right, the average person, uh, this is another flaw of democracy overall. It's supposed to be some sort of deeply thoughtful political expert, and that's just not the way it is. There has never been a time, ever, where the overwhelming majority of the population really had a deep understanding of their political system, ever. Never happened, never in any country, never on any continent. It has never been the case. Uh, politics is usually engaged in by a small, active minority, and the masses just kind of go along with it. I am not muted. How am I muted? Uh, I don't know, guys. I can't be muted. But other people are saying I'm not. Gur or Jur is here. Russia could also support other countries via veto, for example, in the UN. Uh, yeah, well, that's exactly another thing is, too. Why would, again, using an example of a sort of somewhat corrupt or questionable organization that doesn't really serve Russia's interests most of the time or anyone's interests besides the West, why would you stay in it? Because of something like that veto vote where you can help out or you could maybe uh, provide influence or sabotage plans. Because remember, the West is the empire of lies. So, you know, within NATO, like NATO, the UN, the bureaucracy is written for this to look like some sort of actual organization. Basically, the wheels and cogs are there to make it seem like what it is or what they're, they want it to be. The sneaky stuff is what makes it work for the Western masters. But uh, yeah, oh, I'm explaining that badly. The bureaucracy is the way it should be for the organization to do its stated goal, even though most of the time it doesn't. And Russia can manipulate that fact all the time. No, don't leave the UN. That would be stupid unless Russia can take 40% or more of the members with it. Well, yeah, that's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. We're talking about, again, about this... Um, is Russia an evil traitor to the multipolar world? And it's just part of the global's plan because it's still in the World Health Organization. Oh, you know, there's often many reasons and a lot of things are very conflicting. So anyways, okay, just me. We'll exit Telegram and try again. We'll see you very soon, right? Uh, Brexit says, uh, Brexit, okay. Uh, Brexit was very hard fought over. It really was a big topic within the news. Uh, that's not the people rising up to make some sort of change. Furthermore, when the Brexit vote actually happened, what, what happened? Five years of stagnation, nothing really changed, and essentially very little has changed since Brexit. The people who wanted Brexit to, to be like this removal from Europe, uh, maybe on some tax level they did, and that's it. Brexit is not an example of uh, any sort of major democratic change. It didn't. It did change the party affiliations within England. Uh, it did not uh, change anything to do with the other destructive elements of uh, postmodern life that are occurring in England. Um, it kind of made a little bit of difference with the tax, but again, that wasn't a people's movement. That was well organized. Um, Dustin Schultz, that's my problem. I have two choices: Democrats, Republicans. I won't vote for either of them. There is no alternative choice. So there you go. And that's another example of this whole thing, like you. You need to do something. Democracy, democracy. Well, you can either vote for one party, you can vote for the other. The vote might not be real. The parties are not really uh, bound to represent anyone by any means. If you rise up against that, then the CIA kills you. And that's the way it is, my friends. So anyways, example, Egypt. They fought for freedom and democracy, then voted for an Islamic dictatorship. Uh, of course, they got the people what they deserve. Again, what people, uh, especially for a democracy, right? So the people get what they deserve. 
Okay, so Brexit, let's go back to Brexit. Brexit was a belief, I believe, wasn't it a 51-49 decision? So by a, so half the people got what they deserve and the other half don't. But those are two really big halves. So who got what they deserve? That's another thing. So that means that for all the people who put all their effort into uh, stopping Brexit, they got what they deserve. I guess it's because they didn't advertise it very well. All right. Um, yeah. Um, okay. And again, uh, unfortunately, I am not really up on Egyptian um, history. But uh, okay, let's put it this way. <clears throat> now I'm starting to get angry. Italy doesn't really have a lot of resources. I know a lot of people in Italy, and if you look at especially the Italian, uh, like the, the, the breakdown of public opinion, it's pretty split. Italy is definitely not just this like nation of troglodytes who just sort of go with the West wherever the West goes. Maybe the young people do, but at least the people who are 30 years old or older really don't. And they're still stuck in the EU, and they're still stuck with all these self-destructive programs. Are they getting, getting what they do? Deserve. So essentially, okay. So let's just say that. Um, oh, here's the one. Ah, mm, yeah, good example. The people in the Donbass, who for the last uh, ten years, not eight, excuse me, eight, have been being killed by the uh, neo-Nazi battalions. Uh, you know, and tortured, and, and at the very least, intimidated. Well, they lost the Maidan Revolution. So did they get what they deserve? I'm just asking. So what you're saying is, uh, you know, well, they didn't fight the color revolution very well. Uh, they get what they deserve. Okay. So so is that it? Did those uh, uh did the uh, Madonna of I forget what city who got her legs blown off and uh, held her child while the child died? Did she deserve it? You get the political desist system you deserve. All right. Um, Dustin, you have to check out Michael Malice. I don't know who that is, but Malice, that's a brutal last name. Dustin Schultz. No, I haven't heard of him. Uh, I helped fight and win Brexit. Mm, uh, money from important people helped a lot more, my friend. Brexit is an ongoing process. Brexit was the people's movement. Crikey. We're up against the entire establishment. If you're up against the entire establishment, you'd lose. You would have lost. If the entire establishment were against it, so for example, too, if one hundred, if the entire establishment in Russia were against Putin, he would have been killed a long time ago. That's not the way the world works. That is mis mystical, magical thinking. America didn't deserve Biden. Yes, thank you. Well, we didn't vote for him. So... <clears throat> Uh, you know, uh, in a lot of ways, guys, uh, remember that uh, the peasants of medieval England, uh, do they deserve the king they have or not? I don't know. <laughs> and the uh, North Koreans, do they deserve the king that they get? I don't know. Uh, I don't think that that's a very good way of doing it. Um, I, I guess you could say that maybe people need to try to be politically active to fight for what they want. So that way they're not uh, basically... There's only one throne, and if you lose it, you're going to pay. Maybe that's a better expression, but this whole deserving things, I don't like. That's a very, that's a very, very dark road. That's a very, very bad ideological road that some people just deserve it. You know, some people just deserve it. They uh, believe in the wrong religion. Some people just deserve it. Or two, that's the whole thing about uh, the, the colonization of Africa. Well, they don't have much technology. I don't see it. Well, I don't, sitting in Victorian London, uh, and frankly, my friend, I, I don't believe they have any cities or uh, infrastructure to speak of. I, I, I do believe that uh, we're, we're benefiting them uh, because uh, they deserve to be colonized because they're simply uncivil, completely uncivil. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, this whole deserving stuff, that is a... Uh, 
who deserves what is a quick way to jump from reasonable political discussion to fascism immediately. Was the Maidan revolution democracy? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, it depends. Uh, it certainly occurred, and they won. <laughs> One side won, the other side lost. Well, if democracy is ruled by the people, the one side was able to organize 40,000 guys to go out there and street fight to win. That's how it was settled. Perhaps that's democracy. Or perhaps democracy is a sham. Anyways, I'm sorry, the camera very, table is very shaky today. I think I did something wrong. Anyways, what does the uh, contemporary Orthodox Church think of other religions, especially non-Abrahamic ones, Big Surge, specifically in the context? You know what, Big Surge? I'd like to search for quotes on that. Uh, maybe I'll get to that another day. We'll get to that another day. Uh, Timotayo, we were up against Parliament, the Civil Service, the House of Lords, the media, and the Supreme Court. Where'd you get the money from to make the advertisements? To spread the information about this in the news to get for people to vote Brexit, where to come from? Pete, uh, Italy hasn't had an election. No, 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 exactly. Uh, violence and one man, one vote are not the same thing. One was revolution, the other is democracy. Then again, we get to democracy, then who decides who's on the ballot? Might makes right, my friend, and whoever decides who gets on the ballot is this. So, again, with de this democracy, at what point then? So, okay, so the Maidan Revolution is a violation of democracy because it was uh, essentially decided by violence, okay? All right. Well, uh, I come from a country that system only could have happened, the ch had the chance to come into being because of a violent uh, uh, war of independence, so at what point then does America go from being violent overthrow time to, or maybe not overthrow, because overthrow would mean that's the wrong term, violent systemic change to then it's a democracy. Okay. And it's sort of like, too, throughout America's history, then at what point was America a democracy? Was it the beginning when they had this sort of more open format where there weren't really political parties? Uh, would the two-party system be considered a democracy uh, when it's extremely hard to get on the ballot? I've talked to people who work in the third parties. Um, so, at what point is this? What point does a, does a democracy stop being a democracy? When does it earn that title then of being a democracy, and when doesn't it? Uh, because if it means your your nation is birthed by violence, then America was never a democracy, ever. Because well, we were. And that's not a bad thing. That's just the way it is, man. Just like with the Maidan Revolution. It's uh, the, the same thing. Birth, b uh, born by blood, you know. Uh, and although America's really never had to uh, particularly forbid uh, political parties, which is very nice of it, they do do a good job of keeping them down. By making them have to have, you know, like these uh, 50... Uh, you have to have, you know, have like representatives in all 50 states. And uh, even just for the Green Party to get on the ballots is an, is an achievement uh, in all 50 states that they achieved uh, many years ago, 12 years ago or something for the first time. So does that mean America was then never a democracy or it was? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, anyways, in effect, you're arguing there's no such thing as democracy. Correct. There is no such thing as democracy. Democracy is a lie. Democracy is a lie. Uh, so yes, it is. Maybe we'll, we'll get to that. Sorry guys. Maybe the rest of you are kind of dropping off here. I'm not saying, nope, doesn't, no one seems to be dropping off. So maybe you guys are interested, but no, dem democracy is a lie. It is a complete lie. It is a sham. It is a falsehood. Uh, I have made many, uh, pieces of material about this over the years. Maybe I'll have to make a new one. Uh, but, uh, no, democracy is a lie. Anyways, we are going to go on through our big political news to uh, the next topic, which is Igor Dadon is arrested. So Igor Dadon, speaking of uh, of, of, of uh, democracies and questionable elections, uh, Igor Dadon uh, lost uh, the last elections in Moldova, despite his popularity, bringing stability to the country, so on and so forth. And now he is spending some time in under house arrest. Oh, my gosh. What is going on with this? Let's get this open on the screen here. Uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. Where is he? Here we go. Uh, it says, the first statements of ex-president Dadon, again, it's debatable, whom the court placed under house arrest for 30 days. I Oh, and that's another thing. Remember about democracy. Some countries recognize, uh, like other countries, will recognize the results of one uh, election and others won't. So remember, that's also very important with, for the, who the people vote for. It also depends who gets recognized. 
Ooh, by other countries. So that's another fun aspect of democracy we often forget about. If it wasn't for Russia and China, then uh, what's his name? Guaido would be in power in uh, Venezuela for sure because the United States recognized him as a legitimate leader until they needed oil, and then they changed their mind. <laughs> so the first, the first statements of ex-president Dadon, whom the court placed under house arrest for 30 days. I think this case is political, commissioned by Maya Sandu, he said. These are all quotes. 53 prosecutors are engaged in my case. This is the first time in the history of the country. I'm not sure if that's true. We'll just have to believe them. Uh, I was not able to find much information about um, uh, if there's ever been such a major legal case in the history of Moldova. Uh, next, it is strange and low to hear that I betrayed the motherland while all state institutions were flooded with foreign advisors. It's low to hear that I betray oh uh, that I betrayed the motherland for those who call NATO here. I believe NATO to come here. So yeah, so it's kind of a one thing is he's uh, being accused of being a traitor because he's pro-Russian for the most part, uh, but uh, which is typical, you know. And that again goes back to democracy uh, in this whole thing. If it's like, well, if uh, Russia becomes the next superpower, and the United States fades back in terms of power, uh, then guess what? Uh, Mr. Dodon is going to be a patriot, and he's probably going to get a good chance of becoming president again. Uh, if uh, Russia is to fall apart, not only am I dead as a duck, uh, he, Mr. Dodon's uh, political career is over for the rest of his life, however long that may be. Um, cases, again, another quote from him, cases of illegal enrichment are opened against anyone who is objectionable, 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 thank you, to the authorities. So essentially, he's accusing them of uh, going on a witch hunt for anyone who's against uh, the current mainstream, which is uh, what happened in Kiev after our good old Maidan. The Kiev authorities do not like any competition, be it extremely democratic or extremely undemocratic. The first goal of this is to divert the attention of citizens from real problems. The second goal is the elimination of opposition forces. The third goal is to break me psychologically, but I will not give up. Okay. So that's what he has to say. House arrest, 30 days coming up for the president of, uh, uh, former president of Moldova who may have gotten shafted in the last elections. So again, here's a question. Is it democratic or not? Uh, are these 53 prosecutors, are they telling the truth or not? It's up to you. Uh, anyways, moving on in our big news, do we have any more comments? Anyone telling me to go F myself, which would make the show even more interesting. Um, what is, the, what is democracy? Universal suffrage with minimal infringement of rights. Okay. Uh, well, children don't get a vote. Uh, a lot of people who with certain restrictions don't get a vote. It's hard for me to vote in America. So if there's universal suffrage, uh, with, oh, oh, but uh, excuse me, sir. North Korea has universal suffrage. It does. And you could say infringement of rights. Well, they have communist rights. Communist rights are a different set of rights based on a different set of logic. Uh, and uh, North Korea would say that they uh, actually abide by those rights. So there you go. Do not mess with the team. The team is strong. Strong in mind and body. Uh, let's see. Uh, ooh, our next article, which is fun for me, interest rates in Russia drop to oh, 11%. Oh, that's 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 not what I was wanting. I was kind of hoping it'd be lower, but uh, yeah, unfortunately, uh, I'm still gonna maybe have to wait to buy a new car. Well, take out a loan for a new car. Uh, let's see. It says the Bank of Russia. I'm reading from Russian. The Bank of Russia, uh, at its most recent meeting of the uh, board of directors, lowered the the the. Interest rate, national interest rate, uh, by 3% to 11% annually. This is the press release. The accounts of the... So anyways, the yearly uh, inflation in the Russian Federation in April uh, reached 17.8%, but on the 20th of May, it... Uh, uh, stop, slowed down to 17.5%. So, uh, guys, remember, that's one of the downsides. The ruble is really gaining on the dollar, but that's because the dollar is hyperinflating like nuts because uh, the ruble actually has gone 
through a serious inflationary period, and yet it's still jumping at the dollar. So, uh, <laughs> uh, very interesting. What a what a weird world we live in. But I also saw this interesting chart chart that showed the value of money globally. Uh, kind of almost all currencies are going through a really bad inflationary period. So uh, Russia is best of the worst uh, in terms of this uh, 2022's inflationaries. Uh, again, you're not talking to an economist here. Perhaps there's an economist who heard that and was like, Tim, you're a naive twit. Excuse me. Uh, if you want to come on the show as an economist, I'd be thrilled to talk to you. Absolutely thrilled. So anyways, let's see. Well, do we have any messages? Anything interesting? Juicy. Uh, we're getting into more our circular arguments about democracy. Uh, again, democracy is flawed, but it's still the best form of government, Winston, Winston Churchill. Uh, dude, 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 that is such a bad argument. Okay. That's, again, the sort of reasoning like, well, gosh dang, the horse may not be uh, the best. You know, there might be a better way to think to get around, but gosh dang, horse is the best thing we got. We don't need anything else. That is just that is just a the, what that is is a democracy is flawed but still the best form of government. That's a meme in the sort of sociological sense, not like a funny picture people share, but a meme is that it's like an idea that you implant sort of into someone and it kind of grows on its own. And what does it tell you? It tells you don't look farther. That we're at the apex of creation, the system as it is today, that Winston Churchill happened to be a part of, by the way, does not need to change. Isn't that interesting? You know, that's kind of like me going into two and I'm uh, I, I own an egg factory and I'm like, the egg is the ultimate nutrition source. We do not need to. Uh, it's, it's the ultimate. It is the alpha in the omega of nutrition sources. We will not develop pork or beef or any, no, we've got eggs. And it just so happens that I run the egg factory. <laughs> Come on, man. Come on, let's, uh, let's turn down our thinking. It's, that is, that is a, a, it's the same thing like I've told people before at this Woodrow Wilson. Woodrow Wilson go, goes out there and says, you know what? We're going to stand up and defend the rights so that way every uh, nation, nation on earth, every ethnicity will have its own sort of, you know, nation state or whatever. Says the leader of a country that can bring people in and instantly make them Americans. Brilliant. Absolutely Brilliant. So yeah, that's that that's a that's a meme that's it's still working. Churchill said it now, and it's still a good means of uh, psychologically repressing people to this day, because it's the best system. It's you know, it has problems. We just have to accept it, but it's the best. Don't think outside the box. There's nothing else. Nothing new could happen tomorrow. Shh. Mm -hmm. There you go. So anyways, uh, ba -ba 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 -ba, we're getting into If North Korea had universal suffrage, then they have the government that they deserve. Oh, well, but then we're all, no, 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 no. We're not doing whataboutism. You were talking about democracy. So then you're saying that it's a, it's a democracy. Okay, so then your democracy works. You get North Korea. All right. If you, so you stand for that sort of, those sort of values. That's it. And then you say that they get the government that they deserve. Then okay. All right. So that's it. So if you feel that their government is evil, and so that means, uh, so then are you saying that every North Korean is an idiot? They are a schmuck? Or maybe I should say this. If, let's just take the North Korean stereotypes as being true, the worst stereotypes. So if the worst stereotypes about North Korea are, tr are true, and if the North Koreans get the government that they deserve, does that mean that the North Koreans themselves are subhuman or stupid or inferior to you? And also, if we are to allow a bad system to come into place, then do we deserve to be broken and oppressed by that system? So say, for example, uh, you know, uh, in Scandinavia, uh, 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 someone, uh, uh, you know, maybe I'm kind of jumping all over the place. Let's just say somewhere. A, repress a repressive regime comes into place somewhere in the West, right? So does that mean that then all the people in the West deserve to suffer? When when they come and they you do these massive taxes against you, when they take your kids because of uh, juvenile justice programs, uh, the whole, uh, you know, uh, migrant uh, replacement. So you you deserve that. You earned it. You you deserve that. That that also means that when you deserve something, that means that someone should be allowed to do it to you. So you agree with that? Very strange reasoning. I'd really, really, if I were you, I'd really separate these concepts. 
Uh, I think that uh, we should, you should say that perhaps we have a responsibility to become politically active in our country, less other people, because someone is going to be driving politics and it would be better if it would be good people. Okay. Maybe that would be a better alternative to this deserving stuff. Uh, Mark is here. Mark Stone Weapon. Yes. Jerome Powell, FED will have, uh, well, Fed will have to continue to raise interest rates towards the bore rate. Oh my God. I forgot what that stands for. Uh, US <laughs> rates going up and rube rates going down. Where will the equilibrium be? Uh, everyone's saying 20 to 30 rubles a dollar. I don't know. I don't even know what's going to happen. Uh, we're, we're, I think we're in kind of uncharted waters. I don't want to make predictions on that and be proven to be an idiot. Uh, big surge. Democracy always degenerates into tyranny, except in green Libya. But we all know how that ended in 2001. Uh, well, yeah, and also, uh, I guess, you know what? Because uh, Gaddafi's supporters aren't really good fighters, and they weren't able to negotiate with Russia and China. They got what they deserved. Uh, ever since then, we've been living in a post-democratic age. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In the not so distant future, I'm anticipating the, an announcement uh, from the BRICS and other like minded countries that its trading bloc is officially adopting the ruble as a competing reserve currency and commodity. Well, Mark, uh, Sergey Glazyev said that they're trying to put together something that's going to be a, a universal value based on 20 different um, um, commodities, you know, wheat, gold, steel, or something, 20 different commodities. And the average of certain major currencies, including the ruble, which will give this sort of mathematical value of this sort of uh, intermediary unit that won't be controlled by anyone. So we'll be sort of unbiased, you know, those like set up the system and then the system works by calculating itself on its own. And that way no one can really, well, of course, if someone really wants to, they'll find a way like uh, Russia could specifically say, well, of these 20 commodities, we're going to pick the ones that we're really good at producing. And if any we're not so good at producing, we're just not going to have them. You know, they could rig the game that way, but um, I still that's not much of a rigging. But anyways, uh, so, yeah, it's going to be based on the, the commodity basket and um, the value of major currencies. Uh, now the truth is coming out. So far, the EU has only been successfully seizing a uh, 24 billion one tenth of Russia's reserves. Could it be that friendly countries refuse to seize Russia's reserves? Oh, that's interesting. How about we share this to the whole? Oh, that is on. Oh my gosh. Oh, oh wait, 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 wait. How about how do we share this forward? That's actually just a really good article. That's kind of a neat article. We're going to share this to the group. We're going to go back to the chat. Brain, don't fail me now. Don't fail me now. And we're going to take a look at this. That's actually big news. Yeah, Brussels says about twenty-four billion. Okay, uh, uh, from oh, I've reached my article limit. Go f yourself, Reuters. Brussels, May twenty-fifth, Reuters. European Union states have reported the freezing of about twenty-three billion euros of Russian assets. Central bank top. The officials said on Wednesday were feeling first figure uh, expected to be much higher. Uh, that's very possible. There could have been backdoor action to not freeze it by certain parties. Um, who are kind of skeptical and perhaps they don't feel that they need to do that at this point or who knows. Remember, guys, we're getting into asset freezing than asset stealing. Uh, we're getting into a world of cloak and dagger and shadows and uh, I'm not sure, but that's a good, that's a really good article, friends. If you haven't run out of articles you're allowed to read by Reuters uh, for free, then you should really uh, check that out. That's a, that's a Jim Dandy one. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Timmy Tayo continues. I'm saying North Koreans are not living in a democracy because their rights are constantly being infringed. If their rights are communist, they're not being infringed. <laughs> you ever read the Soviet constitutions? I have. Therefore, the North Koreans do not have the government that they deserve. Well, if you judge rights based on the Soviet systems or communist systems, they do. Okay, well, then here's one uh, uh, in America, right? So in America, everyone says that their rights are being trampled upon. Nah, 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 nah. So again, it's like, okay, if you trample on the rights, you don't have democracy. So then again, so basically, okay, so when America was good and America followed people's rights, okay, at some point, right? It was, a, you, it was in a good mode. Okay, again, again, I use America because it's the country I'm very familiar with. So America's in good mode. Then America, we could say hey, there are certain things that are a violation of people's rights more and more every day. Okay, 
But you said if you violate people's rights, then they don't have the government that they deserve. So you can only have the government you deserve if it, the situation is good. But as soon as then the situation gets bad and rights are being violated, then that doesn't count anymore. That's not a democracy. So then that means America is not a democracy. But since it's not a democracy, people don't get the government that they deserve. Again, man, you're, 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 it's, it's not a good. It's not a good logic. You this this you get with the government that you. It's not a good. It's not an honest logic. If you do not participate in politics, politics is going to get participated in by somebody, and it should be you. That's true. Argue that. That's that's essentially what you you're trying to say, but you're using someone else's meme. Use my meme; it's better. Uh, Mark Stone weapon, superb. Let's yeah yeah oh yeah. Uh, let's see. Oh, do, do, we're we're seeing this one again. Yeah, why, why is this here being posted twice? No, I'm I'm afraid. I'm afraid I don't know what's going on. Anyways, uh, no one else seems to be raising their hand. Remember, guys, you can raise your hand and participate in this discussion. Tell me to go f myself, which is always fun. Uh, and uh, you can uh, you know, share things to the chat. That's fine. We only have one more major piece of news before I hit the road here, uh, and that is uh, gonna be oops, something blinked on the screen. What is blinking? Oh my goodness. Uh, so anyways, let's go here. That is, uh, Lukashenko is, uh, uh, putting up a command of his own military forces on the, uh, for the Southern front. Remember, because Belarus is above Ukraine, uh, that uh, sort of points the direction. So apparently they weren't really very militarily organized. Uh, let's do a quick translation of this because my ability to translate and talk to you at the same time stinks. Uh, so here we go. Uh, Lukashenko said that the, t the time has pushed us so quickly that the fact that we are immediately in need to create this operational direction along with the Western Northwestern will be the Southern wing. So apparently uh, they're, they're actually defending themselves to the North and West, which is uh, interesting. Very worried about a Polish invasion. Lukashenko said in the video clip in his speech at the meeting of the defense ministry on Thursday, it was quoted by, yeah, according to Lukashenko, even without creating it, the Southern Operational Command. Today in the Republic, they are quickly forced, they are being forced to do so quickly on the move with the work to protect our southern borders. There's a rotation of the armed forces, special operations forces, battle tactical groups, which according to my decision, are sent to the south and cover uh, together with the border troops, the president said. We have to carry out this rotation. This is my strict requirement. And this is where our military will be tested. These are wartime conditions, but so far without war. Lukashenko noted. So Lukashenko is preparing some sort of new uh, southern theater of operations, although he's – so again, this is this political talk. We're going to prepare this like southern theater of operations, but we're not in a war, but we're in wartime conditions. Okay, that's 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 some uh, political ease right there, my friends. That is some political ease for sure. Anyways. Oh, that's nice. Ah, all right. So anyways, uh, I'm going to take a last look at the chat. I hope we had a good time today. Sorry I got a little, I'm a little feisty today, my friends. Uh, there have been some uh, personal frustrations <laughs> in my in my life as of late. Uh, so anyways, let's take a look at maybe these um, uh, last few messages here. And then we'll hit the road. Um, Kiansky, Kian, uh, Kiansky, excuse me, Kiansky. Good luck to the anti-vax and conspiracy people. Aim well. Uh, he's commenting on something he saw in the group. He might not even be listening. But anyways, um, yeah. Uh, and, uh, we'll see. It's going to be, uh, I'll put it this way, in the Western world, it's going to be in, uh, continuously tougher and tougher to have beliefs that go against uh, the establishment thanks to uh, big data and so on and so forth. Mo. Could you comment on Zelensky's 700,000 soldiers getting ready for a counteroffensive? Well, I'm, the first thing I'm going to say is uh, this statistic that before the war, Ukraine had 900,000 soldiers uh, is really overinflated. Uh, I think that they had a more, again, some people read that they had a 900,000 man standing army, which is interesting. And uh, I guess that also, excuse me. Doesn't include the private battalions, which I think may have even totaled up to like a, a thousand guys. 
I just can't believe that. Based on the way they're fighting, um, based on, on the casualties they're taking versus the amount. Uh, if we listen to Scott Ritter's recent analysis, he thinks that the Ukrainians are at about the 80,000 to 90,000 losses category. And they seem to be utterly short on guys and utterly broken. If they really had a million man armed, trained fighting force again, and they feel that they're in this existential battle for their survival against the Russians, why send so few guys? Uh, you know, it's especially, well, the border is big. If you especially consider Belarus, they do have a lot of territory to cover, but I just think it's very, I don't really believe that they have really 700,000 standing army trained soldiers. What I think they have is up to 700,000 sort of like reserves. That's more what they're talking about. So I don't know. Um, People are saying there's going to be a counteroffensive offensive again with what they can't really get a lot of equipment to the front and the equipment they can get isn't really going well. Uh, what is this counteroffensive going to look like? Where, especially where's it going to be launched from? That, here's a good question. Okay. So if this is going to be like a sort of concentrated uh, attack, where's it coming from? Because like I showed you guys before uh, in some of the videos, the Russians have really destroyed all the train networks that go sort of like above Odessa. And, uh, you know, the Russians, I believe, haven't blown up the bridges over the Dnieper, which they may regret later. But a lot of littler bridges and all the roads have been blown up. Again, you're talking, you're going to have to move these guys hundreds of kilometers in the 21st century. Hope this massive offensive doesn't get noticed. And they're going to be going over broken, rough terrain. I guess they're being armed by NATO, but apparently the Polish tanks they sent suck. Well, they were Soviet-made tanks that didn't get the upgrades they needed. Uh, the howitzers they sent <clears throat> are all towed, you know, old school, hard to use. I don't know. I, I just really doubt this narrative of this uh, massive counteroffensive. I could be wrong. Again, I'm not a military expert. I'm not a military historian. I could be wrong, but I just it just doesn't seem very viable. Gur or Jur. The story of Ukraine attacking Transnistria has died a death. Yeah, it started. There were some explosions around Tirasopol, uh, and um, yeah, and now it's kind of dived down. Very interesting. But again, the Don being held captive, at least for the foreseeable future, in a pleasant manner in his own house. Remember, because, um, well, if you are looking for a leader to rise and bring the people up, against NATO uh, and uh, the evil gay forces of the West in Moldova, who would it be? So sort of the key opposition figure has been at least uh, temporarily locked up, even though I'm sure his house is very nice. Uh, so uh, Pete says, I'm fluent in political ease, and that's why you're here, baby. That's why you're here with me. What is the meme of yours again? I'd like to think about it for some time, some more. Well, T Timmy Tayo, first thing I'll tell you is I have not worked it out completely, but I would say that uh, it uh, goes to the, the logic of basically if you don't get in involved in politics, politics is going to get involved in you. And that essentially uh, really only a small percent of people really have a lot of influence over politics uh, in any particular given nation. And uh, you can either be an influencer or you can be the influenced. And it's your choice. I think it's, uh, it, it gives the same sort of, it achieves the results that you want from what you were saying. But without getting into this weird sort of mind games of some people deserving something under certain circumstances without other people deserving it under other circumstances. Anyways, Marietta, uh, Marietta, hello. I don't think we've ever talked before. So Marietta is responding to something, and she says that things are really getting out of hand in the USA, and especially in California. I mean, the nature is nice, but the social structure is horrible. Marietta, if you're listening, could you give us more details about that, what, what you mean specifically? Uh, but, uh, yeah, trust me, there's plenty of beautiful stuff in America. There are things like American football that I do so love. Uh, but uh, these political trends are not making anyone happy. Uh, yes. And whether we have democracy or not, uh, or democracy existing or not, I'll tell you one thing. When America has this sort of 
we have a two party system or maybe one day three or something. We sort of have this idea of what America is. We kind of have a little debate over this. You know, we have our constitution at the core. We have these sort of two parties that are sort of debating about sort of, you know, how we are going to go and, you know, to go about this whole vision of America and all that little bit of friendly debate between each other. And then we have these elections, which uh, hopefully yield results that are actually based on true public opinion. Uh, that would be a, a nice thing to return to. That would be a very, very nice thing to return to. Because uh, remember, there was a time when uh, you could be sort of liberal and really, you know, like pro-labor and still also be very pro-constitution. Uh, it's a sad thing that those times are over with. That was a, that was a good thing. Anyways, uh, Mo is continuing. Yeah, I think they said they're reserved mostly. Yeah, all who can fight, I guess, but they could be trained. How fast and how good? Uh, again, one thing that I believe it was Scott Ritter said is uh, one problem is that a lot of these guys who sort of signed up for selective service did it on some sort of weird, like, local program where essentially until their little state, you know, not, not that's not to be, con I didn't say that to be, that sounded really condescending, until their Ukrainian province, state, oblast gets invaded, they're not supposed to be activated. Of course, they could change that rule, you know. Kiev doesn't care about <laughs> keeping their agreements, but as it stands now, like, I think it's sort of like some sort of more like civic defense or, you know, defend the homeland. So if my region gets attacked, then I have to stand up and defend it kind of logic. So I don't know if that's true. He just sort of said that. I can't really confirm or deny that, but yeah, I, I really, again, I really do not think that Ukraine's been maintaining this titanic, highly trained army. And again, you know, if they did have it and they had all the the goodies for a million man army, right? Then they wouldn't be running out of supplies right now. I mean, yeah, Russia's destroyed like 3,000 or whatever tanks or something ridiculous, but for a million guys, they'd have more than that. I don't know. Just It, it just doesn't, it, it just doesn't add up, my friends. It just doesn't add up. Uh, so I don't know. Yeah. Um, but it, it, but again, uh, I, there's things that I know and things that I don't know. This is one where uh, speculation alert. Uh, maybe someone could make a nice animation for that. Speculation alert. I am speculating uh, based on other things that this is not the way it is. But um, anyways, guys, we're going to call it for today. How long have we been recording? Who knows? I can't even see. Usually it displays it somewhere. My God. My God, it's not being displayed. How awful. But anyways, I'm going to end this. Uh, We're going to stop the recording right now. So see you. Stop recording. Boom. Yes.